Hello everyone, welcome back to Pablo Irons. It's Slop and myself today, no Frankie, but we will endeavour to uh, keep you all engaged and uh, give you a, a good review of the game. And uh, what a game, Slop. 2-0, great result for us. Um, we'll obviously dig into the game, but what were your initial feelings after, after that result? I think it was a fantastic away performance. It was something that... Um, well, I, d I think neither of us were expecting a clean sheet. I think Frankie and I both put in our pre-match predictions that we would concede. But I think we looked a little bit shaky in the first half, and obviously we'll cover all of that. But the second half, we just really stepped it up a gear, and, and I don't think Palace could quite match it. Um, and, yeah, just really, really positive. And I thought that... Lopetegui, Lopetegui's changes and his um, approach. Obviously, the half-time uh, team talk was massive for us mm. because we looked, as I said, like we'd gone up a gear in that second half. And yeah, just really good to be sat here with a smile on my face while we're recording this one. <laughs> yeah, and talking of changes, we started the game with a distinct lack of changes from the Villa game, which we, you know, I think we can all say that we struggled quite a lot until the towards the end of that first half um some of it reminiscent of what we saw in in the last in the game against palace but we lined up with no changes um i guess it was a bit of a surprise for all of us i think many of us expect to see Tadebo in there probably one Bissaka as well <laughs> however we've got to say the fact that the result is what it is and you know this is how it looked in the game yes we had less possession but we had quite a substantial number of shots free on target didn't complete as many passes and our average uh, kind of you know, percentage to completion wasn't great. However, we got in their area a lot and we covered a lot of distance as well under Lopetegui, something that we, he's, a, he's always going to put you in good stead and obviously got the result. But when you saw saw the lineup, did you have like some trepidation because of what happened in the Villa game that maybe there's been put too much faith or did you maybe feel that what Lopetegui is trying to do is to use a team that he's had more of uh, in terms of time with him and then maybe thinking about changes maybe in the the City game or further ahead after the international break where we'll maybe see what is going to be his first team. I think it's, it was a, a bit of a mixture of things. Like I, I said to, to Frankie in the preview that we did where um, I said basically I, I think he'll, he'll stick with a, a similar lineup, if not just to say, look, you lost to Villa. Go out and uh, go out and show me why you should keep your place in the club, or, or you know, go out and show me why I shouldn't look to move you along. And I think many players stepped up to that. Um, I think some kind of wilted, but it was a case that I always think that these early few games is it's where the manager really sees the players properly. You know. Pre season is a different animal altogether. And I think that there would have been a bit of um, that in Lopetegui's mind, where not only does he want to, he has his team in his back mind, he has his, you know, team for the season obviously set up in his head. But you can't just write off players. And look, it's, it's something that we were critical about the previous manager for, who seemed to have favourites. When you're coming into a new club, you can't just expect to lay down the law. Like, you know, the, the famous Brian Clough sort of cliche coming into Leeds United and telling everyone that they were crap. Um, and that's not how you play football. You can't expect to do that. And um, I think he's basically looked at it and said, you can, you can try and impress me. And I've got my starting 11 for the season in my head. If you want to disrupt that, if you want to make any changes, you've got to force it. I think, as I mentioned, some players will have stepped up to that and I think they are trying to really prove themselves. I think others have kind of wilted. But um, I think it's also a bit of building that match fitness. And, you know, there are certain players who've been away, like Fulkrug, who's not 100% fit yet. And although we were very critical of Antonio's performance last week, um, I think... We always kind of uh, kind of expected Fulcrook to be eased into the seat into the side, and I think 
we, we, we're seeing that with other players as well. But as we said, there were players who were fighting for their shirt and, and I think quite a few of them have, have made a good case. Yeah, I think in particular, we can say Mavropanos in the last two games have been almost probably a dead cert to leave has most likely worked his way back into the squad. Uh, I think Suchek is another one who, granted, whilst doesn't have a great involvement in play, he's shown how vital he can be in both areas. And that, that's the thing with Suchek. He is a flawed player. However, he will give you everything he's got. And is always that, I hate the term, but that clutch player. <laughs> that, that just seems to turn up when you, as and when you need it. But before we get into his effectiveness and, and turning up when exactly when we needed it uh, and being a hero for, for children as well, <laughs> when, they, when there's rope boardings, <laughs> let's get into that first half. And then that first half was a, is even, I think, Palace came at us quite, you know, came at us quite heavy. Uh, you know, uh, Eze was a joy to watch. He normally is, but he was, he was their best player. So is Adam Morton. Morton was probably controlling that midfield incredibly well I would say in that first half and um but we did have opportunities you know uh Antonio in my opinion missed an absolute sitter from a corner at the back post uh, there's another opportunity that was a bit wasted I think by the, by the team as well uh, again from a corner and, and Mo also come very close but for me in the first half I would say Mo was probably our best player from an attacking point of view um whenever we were getting forward he was the one who was driving us forward and one of the stats we were talking about beforehand was Mokudus had the most take-ons in that game. And when I say the most take-ons, he had six, six, six successful take-ons. Palace, as an entire team, had three. That's incredible that we have one player who doubled what their team did. And I think in that first half, the way he carried the ball and tried to take responsibility was impressive. I do you think he needs to release the ball a bit quicker sometimes? Uh, however... He, he was great in that regard. And I think, again, defensively, Mavropanos and Kilman, they, they were solid for me. I don't think any kind of shots that came on, I don't think that could be put on them. I think them two were absolutely solid. And, and Guido seems to be really coming into his own as well. And um, What were your takes in the first half? Well, I mean, Palace appeared to be quite comfortable to sit deep and try and catch us on the break. Obviously, their wing backs are really sort of key in how they press and they tend to play very high. And there were a few moments, particularly in the first 30 minutes, I think, you know, there were a few stats around Adam Wharton that I think kind of don't, they're not very fair on his his overall performance because I think for the first 30 minutes, he was fantastic. Oh, he really um, controlled, controlled the game, in my opinion. That he, first he completely ran the show. And I think it almost caught um, Guido and Paqueta by surprise that, uh, had just how good he was at just linking up the play and finding those wing backs. Um, I was really impressed with him. You know, it kind of kind of dived off a cliff after that, thankfully. But um, it was it was really good, and there, it was clear that there was a plan to double up on Mateta as well. Um, and it was it was really where their um, their their first kind of chance came from a corner, and. It was um, it was it was basically our poor marking. I think we've we, we've really praised the defenders and we'll continue to do so because I think second half again they went up a second gear, but they gave Eze a, a, a massive chance to to um, where he hit the crossbar, and he seemed to just be able to drift free of the markers. And you think he's their most dangerous player, like it's it's just not. It's not sustainable football, as we've said so many times. If you just yeah. let a, a talented player roam free and have all the shots he likes, it's not going to work. Um, and I think it was it was really interesting that we saw two very physical centre backs come up against a very physical forward for that first half. And I don't think Antonio could match their um, physicality. Yeah. I think Mateta matched. Kilman and Mavropanos very well. It was just a case that it eventually started to wear him down. And I think when you're dealing with, you know, two six foot three plus players who are just constantly hounding you, I think you could see him getting frustrated. Yeah, and I'll give it to the ref as well. I think he allowed that game to flow. Yeah. There were the moments where he made some inconsistent calls, shall we say. 
But in general, the game was allowed to be physical and, you know, it was a good ebb and flow kind of end-to-end football at times, which was actually make it quite entertaining compared to what we have seen where we've... I think last year we would have been probably 1-2-0 down by, by the first half because we would have sat so much deeper. But because I think we showed a bit more intent, we uh, we got we got ourselves in a good position for that, that end of that first half. It being nil-nil, I think it's probably a fair reflection on that half. We were, rode our luck a couple of times, especially with the, the SA one. But I think all in all, I think we probably... It was a fair reflection of the game at that point, I think it being nil-nil. Well, I think... Um... You know, I, I kind of made the point about us losing Eze. Palace mm-hmm. lost Antonio twice in the first in the first sort of thirty five minutes. They they lost him twice from corners, and as you said, he, he should really have done better from at least one of them. Um, but it, so it wasn't a, a a great defensive display first half. I think there were elements there, but it was very much a game of of, of two midfields. Um, I think, in my opinion, that's where it was kind of won and lost, particularly for West Ham. And we said last week about how the physicality was going to be very important. And if there's one area that uh, Palace lack in that midfield, it's probably their physicality. That's probably the most obvious one. Um, yeah, you'd probably say Lerma's the only one who's really kind of willing to do that stuff and do it consistently. Yeah. Obviously, Walton has a bit of bite and a tackle, but he's not physical. Uh, I think that was reflected in the fact that he's been the most dribbled pass player in the Premier League in one game. Five times he was say he was dribbled past. No other player has been dribbled past more than Wharton. Uh, and one of those quite damning for him was on that that first, that second goal, which we'll go into that brilliant second goal. Well, in fact, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, yeah, as you say, that that physical presence without the likes of Decore in there. And I think Alessi as well is a huge loss for them. Not having Alessi is, I think we'll see a, a dip in what we saw last year because they have yet to find someone to replace Alessi. I think he, he like, you know, I kind of, I, I was a bit cynical about him in, in the, in the uh, preview and, uh, uh, well, I think it might have been our prediction um, where I think he's a fantastic player. Um, I think his attitude's pretty rotten. Um, I think you could see that from the Olympics as well. Um, it was weird how I kind of said that and I thought, well, maybe I was being a bit harsh. And then I saw that and I was like, mm, yeah, no, that, I thought, <laughs> maybe not. Um, but I think as long as they can get um, someone who gives them that outlet to be able to beat a man and deliver... I think they'll be they'll they'll be fine in terms of pushing for a, a around a middle of the table finish, um, but someone like Elise is incredibly hard to replace, and I think that Saar when he came on, obviously the one that they're trying to sort of factor into that area um, and fill that void, particularly with the goals. I think he looked sharp when he came on and he caused those problems, but. Um, I just worry that maybe they haven't got someone who is a bit more of a bit happier to drift and do different jobs and get stuck in, win possession back. Um, And I think that if we had uh, faced Palace with Elise, I think we may have had a bit more trouble in the first half because, as I mentioned, you know, we tended to lose players and our marking was very poor um, as it was last week. But I think that once we sort of had a rollicking at half-time, that managed to to rectify itself. And I think the players switched on a bit more. Yeah, absolutely agree. And the second half, kind of much of the same ebb and flow uh, right up until the 62nd minute when we made two two substitutes. I think they were the the right substitutes as well. So we took off Vladimir Soufal for Aaron Wan-Bissaka. We took off Mikhail Antonio for Nicholas Falkrub. I think what they also did was really change the dynamic and how we kind of played and the positions. And we're just going to look at this this, this one here, which is the average positions. Uh, you know, on the left hand side is the team that started. On the, the right hand side is the team that finished. So this is their average positions based on the, the minutes that they played. What I think is really quite telling uh, is when you look at. Number 10 and number 24. So that's Guido and that is obviously Lucas Paqueta. 
both of those players played in at six and eight position and were fixed in that position. They held that central space so well once they got to grips, you know, to the point of Sloth, you raised about, you know, that surprise maybe with Wharton, but once they got to grips with that, the way they held and marshaled just in front of that defence was brilliant. And all these calls about, you know, Piquetta can't play as an eight or Piquetta doesn't, I've even heard people saying he doesn't do enough defensively and he's lazy. There's a statistic that has come out from this game that just obliterates this lazy stereotype about Piquetta where him and Jared Bowen were the only players in the Premier League who have ever had more 10 or more uh, times that they've dispossessed the opposition in a game. No other team's ever had two players do that. Uh, and this season, we've had both those players do that. So this idea that he doesn't work hard defensively is, for me, it's nonsensical. It's always been nonsensical. But he was brilliant, I think, once he got to grips with it with Guido. And Guido really kind of grew into that game as well. and was great. But what's interesting is when we look at where Antonio and is, so, so is that so? I think it's very easy to label Paqueta as lazy when when people when people just watch and see him give away the ball. I think yeah. that because of the type of player he is and the type of passes he tends to try and play, or even just his his attitude in trying to take someone on, you know, he, he will lose possession. Right. But I think that people people have uh, they they don't quite pick, uh, understand that. You know, it doesn't paint the whole picture. And as you say, he, he will chase back and get stuck in and he will dispossess someone. Doesn't always work out. You know, it will lead to goals because that's his approach. But it's it it doesn't paint the full picture. And he is an incredibly hard worker. And, you know, that stat is, quite frankly, amazing. I, I, I was really surprised when you told me that. No, um, I was surprised when I saw it yesterday because I, I, I knew he worked hard. I knew Bone worked hard, but I didn't realise just how much of a defensive uh, kind of display they put in. And it's really, really impressive. It's, again, it shows the level of intensity that Lopetegui is asking. I know people say, well, boys wanted people to, to tackle, but we didn't tackle. We sat in a shape and we were very uh, passive. If you've got two players dispossessing your position 10 times each, that shows a level of aggression, a level of uh, kind of pressing that is, you know, causing a lot of benefit to us. And, when we go back to this, when we look at that, one of the things I think Bowen struggled with, particularly in that first half and, and for quite a quite a period, was the fact that essentially he had two other players playing in that inside space, that space he wanted to be. He had Antonio there and he had Suchek there. Obviously, Suchek, when uh, Antonio went off, still kind of hovered in that position. But at, what we saw was Bowen had more space. And the main reason we had more space is because Falkrick was standing more centrally. That meant that their defence no longer could all shift over because you'd have their defence, uh, uh, Mark Gui and uh, as was it uh, Said, I can't remember his name, just completely escaped yeah. me there. Yeah. Playing on that right-hand side, we were able to shift over. So there was actually a lack of space for Bowen. Obviously, Sufar played quite wide, but didn't really get that much involved in the game. And once Falker came in, that all of a sudden meant, they had a proper defense, a proper player that they had to go against who was actually moving it across that line, but also it was creating space for Bowen, was allowing Kudus to kind of hold some space. So when we see number 29 is playing more inside, but that's because, again, this is average positions based on their overall minutes. And when he came on, obviously he played more kind of inside to help us defend our lead. However, you know, player that we have uh, been much blind, <laughs> and I've been very critical of, and I still stand by. I still stand by in the final third. His output is not has not been good enough. He's a very good player on the ball, very good defensively, and he showed his ability on the ball by beating two Palace players to start off what ended up being our first goal, and it was superb play for, from uh, Wamba Saka. And you know, up until that point, I say we struggled on the right hand side. They I think Palace did a really good job on Bowen, constantly doubling up and forcing him back. But this was a point where we had a player who was able to beat a couple of players and then burst in the space. And as much as we love Soufal, this goal would not have happened without with Soufal on the pitch. And that's not a slight on Soufal. It's just two players with two different profiles. And I think had we not had Wan-Bissaka on the pitch at that point, this goal wouldn't have happened. So fair play to Wan-Bissaka. He absolutely showed what he has on the ball. Uh, and let's have a look at the goal, to be honest, and let's break it down. I mean, you know, he breaks out from 
literally on the edge of our own area, beats two players, and then just has acres of space to run into. I took this image because look where Bowen is at this stage. Bowen is well behind Wan Basaka and almost not even involved in this play. And as we kind of progress forward, what Wan Basaka does really well, he realizes he's actually about to get a uh, you know, double team. So he has uh, Riyadh and he has Mitchell both come in to kind of close him. So he cuts back inside. So he, he, he cuts back to, uh, to, to the wide area. And as he turns, he can see uh, where we have uh, Bowie kind of coming through. Now, Eze and Kamada, and this is this happens a, a, on a good few occasions during this goal, are both ball watching. They have no, aware, no awareness as to what's coming up and what's happening in this situation. Now, what wan Saka has done is drawn two players over and created a huge pocket of space for Bowen to run into. Again, this was the point. In the first half, we would probably would have seen Antonio dropping into that space, which would have then just completely taken away the space that uh, Bowen needed. Falkrug has pushed them high. He's held that middle space so that those defenders can't split. They need to stay there to ensure that they can have a 2v1 first against him. But what happens is Walton is completely unaware of what's what's developing as well and doesn't move across. So all of a sudden, Bowen has this acres of space to run into. And when the ball's played into him, he's able to get the ball and burst towards the area. wan again, massive credit for this, bursting down that right-hand side to provide an option. So, you know, there is a reverse pass for Bowen if he wanted to, but he spotted Lucas Paqueta just arriving late on the box. But this is something we didn't see last year. Look how many players we have in that final third. But wan on the right, Bowen charging with the ball, Suchek is doing what Suchek does, which is getting towards the area and arriving late. We have Paqueta joined on the edge of the area. Falkrook is occupying uh, Richards. And then at the back post, we then have uh, Kudis running in uh, where Munoz is. How many times last year, Slav, would you say we'd have had this many players bursting to get into the area? <laughs> it just wasn't something we saw, in my opinion, very, very often. No, it was, it was fleeting, if any, I, I would say. <laughs> I think exactly. I think it's it's a real sort of testament to um, the confidence that players around you give. And yeah. when, you know, we spoke last week about how leading the press works and if you're leading from the front, how, how that affects, you know, the opposition being able to double up on players. And Bullcook was fantastic for this. He, he drew players away from him. And Antonio is a fantastic physical unit. Like he's really physical forward, he causes absolute nightmares for so many opposition defenders. Um, but he was winning absolutely nothing against Gray and against uh, Riyadh. And when he did bring something, unfortunately, his touch just it, it, it was it was it was not a good performance in my opinion. And I he did a lot of running around the pressing, but yeah, I think when when the, it actually but, came towards him, I think it was he. Um, the off. problem for him, the problem for him was that you know I think that when when he feels frustrated, he he leaves this plan of leading the line and he presses as opposed to be as as opposed to being aware of when you should press an opposition and when you should allow a different player to do that and when you should actually just sit on the centre back and make them drop deep. That's what Fulcrook did really really well. Um, and he was able to physically batter both of, of, of their centre backs. He was winning near enough every duel that came I as well. I think he won the most aerial duels in the game. I think he won five aerial duels in total, which is the most of any player. He was fantastic. And look, you can you can say that he missed his chances. And I think that yeah, but I've yeah. got to be in there to, to have yeah. them, right? It, it's very it, it is frustrating, and and I think that. It's one of those things where had he had he got one, you know, people go, oh, what a performance from him. He really came on and it made an impact. Well, you're ignoring the other impact that he made. And that was in the overall play. And like when we mentioned with the groupings there, um, when you have a player who's dropping deep and, and chasing, as opposed to not, not pressing, he wasn't pressing properly. He was chasing the ball, Antonio. That then leaves other players exposed and Suchek then comes over to cover because he thinks, oh, I'll get involved and maybe I can pick up and be a physical presence here as well. It changes the dynamic of where players play. And 
I, I felt in the first half, one of the main frustrations was that Palace targeted that right side really well and they doubled up on Bowen and Sue Fowl and they pressed that area. Antonio then pulled over to, to try and bring the, that space um, and find that pocket where a ball could be played over to him as opposed to actually just leading the line, dragging their centre-backs back and leaving those pockets that you mentioned where where um, Wharton was unaware of Bowen running into. And when you have when you have a player who recognises that, it's, it's, it creates so many more problems for defenders. And again, I don't want to be too harsh on Antonio because, as I mentioned, you know, there were some very positive things that he did. Um, but today was not his, well, yesterday was not his best day. And I think that when you look at the comparison of the two players, one of them was far more effective in the air. He led the line in a very effective way. And he managed to go up against those two Palace centre-backs and understand that actually what I've got to do now is get them to, to drop deeper or to drop more central so that they can't quite double up on someone in the same way. And uh, your usage of the of uh, the term double teamed was uh, interesting. Maybe I've been on Twitter too much, but um, <laughs> I think that <laughs> when um, when it creates that pocket of space, Soufal may well have been able to hop over that first tackle that um, was put in on Aaron Bissaka, but I think he probably doesn't quite have the pace or he's he's not going to have the pace to get away, in my opinion. And I don't think he's going to also necessarily have I guess the guy I'm going to say the guile to which to turn in and then do that outside of the right boot kind of chip yeah flick off into that space um that's, that's what I thought um was that that little bit little bit of a step up and yeah. we've we've criticized Ramba Saka's um delivery at times but I think when you look at that piece of link up play it doesn't matter if he gets no assists on paper. If he can do that, you know, 10 times, uh, that's a bit ambitious, but, you know, five more times a season, then that's as good as an assist for us. That is really vital. And it's I something that, that... I think what he proved there, Slav, is something that we've already said. He's brilliant in those three quarters before you get to the end. And he's realised that and gone, you know what? My, I'm not the best in this quarter. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to flick it through now. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, I am, I am joking, but it's, it's, but essentially, is that it, I do find that funny that he stopped just before the final third and then plays an absolutely brilliant pass and shows some end product. It's just funny that it happened there rather in the final third. It's, it's that kind of thing, though, that when you when you are not told to specifically fit a system or, or your place, you, you've got demands upon you that don't suit your game. That's how much it affects players. You know, we have it all the time with strikers. This is, it's, it's normally an issue you see in the attack as opposed to the defence. And, you know, Trent Alexander-Arnold is a good comparison to make because he's fantastic at the attacking element of the game, poor at the defensive element of the game. And I think that when you look at wan he's got the right back. You know, he's got all the tools you need as a right back to succeed. And if he can continue to link up and play like this, as I mentioned, you know, five more times a season, create these big chances, then on on paper, he won't go down with goal like assists and goals. Doesn't matter though. It's it's about the fact that he is creating these chances. Yeah, it's a contribution to the attack. And that, that's yeah. quite interesting. That it enabled us to transition quickly to exploit the I guess the the, the lack of defensive awareness in uh, Kamada and in Eze and also I guess you would say the inexperience of Wharton to not spot that there's a potential you know gap in that defence that he maybe needs to come across I think if he was two or three yards over to, to his left hand side probably prevents that goal and when we look at this point here obviously it gets laid on to, to Paqueta who <laughs> doesn't have the best shot let's be honest but it then ping pulls around and in fairness to, to Falkrook again he, he manages to keep that alive. He gets it to his feet. Yes, he gets tackled. But by being in the area 
and by showing a, a little bit of smart feet to try and work it onto his right, he actually then inadvertently creates the opportunity. We see here, he has two defenders on him. Look at Suchek as well. That point we kept, I raised around how Kamada and Eze, completely oblivious to, to what was going on in two, two phases of this attack. First off with Bowen, neither one of them was aware of what's happening with Bowen. Bowen gets through. And this is the point of when players are not switched on defensively and you are looking to then, you need to then exploit them and you need to exploit players who are not necessarily renowned for their defensibility. And we did that with Eze in this situation. We did that with Kamada as well. But look at Suchek. Suchek is so alive to what potentially can happen. He's looking at the ball. None of the, the Crystal Palace defenders are looking around and, and trying to see what's happening. And when the ball breaks, he gets in front of Eze. As you can see, Eze is also, he, before he's realised Suchek is there, Suchek is already lining up to shoot. Yeah. And it was a brilliant finish. But again, look look at all those Palace players. He has such a limited space in which to put it. He only can really put it one one position. And he does it perfectly. Well, it's I think just a fantastic like, finish from Suchek. We mentioned, we mentioned Fulcrook and... You know, if, if you watch it in, in real time and mm. from from not too close of an angle, you can see that when he takes his touch, he pretty much kills it. But yeah. it's 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 like a Wharton is getting ready to clear it. Mm -hmm. And he stops that. That's a huge thing. It's, it's like that Wan-Bissaka start that sort of, it's not something that's going to go down on a stat sheet. But no. if you are watching it, you go, well, that's actually really impacted this passage of play it's, it's made this chance happen because had he not taken a good first touch or been able to get on the end of it then it you know that chance might not happen yeah so, so it keeps it keeps the, keeps it alive because it's, yeah. the ball was pinging around but as you say in that moment is the fact he stops it dead gets it under control and immediately tries to put it onto his right and then it's a little dink kind of tackle from, from the defender but then it just falls perfectly to Suchek, who just finishes sublimely. And fair play to Suchek, runs over to the fans to celebrate. That ball didn't falls, but completely straight away grabs that ball. And unfortunately, you know, the, the young kids is right. But there was a brilliant tweet that went around about like, Suchek and the Disney arc. And one of those points was him <laughs> saving a young child, which was just funny. I, I did also um, I did also enjoy the one where it was wound back and they said to West Ham players shove ball boy underboard and I was like <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the internet's a wonderful place, isn't it? Oh, it <laughs> it's uh, lovely. Best way to see Chick, though, he's been much maligned and some of it rightly, some of it a little bit overzealous, but when we need him, he does tend to come up with those 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 moments and I, I, he's one of those players, and it was a it was a TikTok went around. I think uh, the other week where it just called the uh, <laughs> he's the best box player in the world. <laughs> it would probably be Suchek because he's incredible defending the box. He's incredible in the other area, and I think there's probably not many players you'd want that situation to have fallen for two mm -hmm. in that West Ham team other than Suchek. Obviously, the, the Villa one, let's just say it was a rush of blood, but I think. Normally, that's one that he finishes. And today, I think he showed that point as to if he gets an opportunity that falls to him, he he can finish. And yeah, I think that was no. brilliant for us to score that goal in that period. It was the 69th minute, I think it was, around about that time. It kind of seized the momentum that Palace were trying to build. And I, I, it was a, they gave us something all of a sudden to to really defend. And I felt that, that that really kind of galvanized that team and brought them together even more. And, you know, we've not talked about it a, a bit for a while, but Max Kill and Mavropanos were, were brilliant. Bob Mavropanos is silly little moment, which was a back heel. <laughs> I think when we were one nil up, yeah, them two were superb. They were rock solid, especially Kilman. You know, he's looking like that 40 million pound player at the moment, the way he's playing, the way he's bringing the ball out, the way he's playing and commanding that back line. He has been superb, and I, I have not got a bad word to say about anything he's done so far in a West Ham shirt since the Premier League has started. I know it's two games, but he's looked brilliant in those well, two I, games. I made the point um, about having confidence in the players around you, and I think that this is this is where you'll see a, a great increase in this defence. Hopefully, I think. It's I again I don't I don't like just 
beating players when they're down and and I think it's I think it's me Mavropanos was incredibly frustrating at times last season and I think that's why you know rightly he was kind of his future was maybe in question but he had Kurt Zuma or Ogbonna next to him and as much as I love Ogbonna when you're playing with a slower centre back it does affect how you how you have to position yourself um what you can and can't do? Can can you get over to something? Can you push for something? Make and try and make an interception. It does affect your game. And when you have someone like Max Kilmer next to you, whose game has been fantastic so far, the confidence level you can immediately take a couple more risks. No more silly risks in in terms of the flicks. But I think it's it grows your game exponentially. And if you can trust the person next to you or just trust that, you know, the majority of the time they're going to make the right decision. That is huge for a centre-back. And, you know, we saw him have great games, Arsenal away, coincidentally our last clean sheet in the league. Um, yeah. Like, that was a fantastic defensive performance. And even then he had a couple of iffy moments. But... Your centre back partner is huge in how you perform, and I think that if anything, these last two games have shown that he has stepped up. You know, I was critical of him in the first game because I do think he tried too many silly flicks. He held onto the ball for too long, but today he was fantastic, and I, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that Tadebo would be looking to come in in the next sort of month or so. But you have to give Mavropanos huge credit in the fact that he's even forcing that issue and, you know, second guessing, coming from a place where we've been told, you know, he was potentially on the transfer list. And if you're asking me now, who should we, who should be sold from that defence? There's only one answer. It should be Aguero. You should be like... No, there's two. Uh, there's Uber as well. But, you know, <laughs> that's well, we're not going to be able to sell him, are we? Like, <laughs> we're no, no. going to <laughs> but I think, I think it's when, um, you, when you have a competent defensive partner next to you, that's when you see the real centre back. Almost they can they can play their way, and I think you have to give huge credit to both of them. I do think Ma um, Kilmer had the better game, but I think Mavropanos deserves a lot of praise for his his performance. Um, yeah, but again, not the flicks. Just, just... No, no, absolutely, and you know, let let's keep the uh, the Max Kilman uh, kind of praise train going, and you know, to, to Frankie's point, Max Kilman is the man. He is a man, the man, Max Kilman. <laughs> oh, it was cringy when he said it last time, so I'm just bringing it back for him. <laughs> but that that second goal, you know, Palace again were building up some pressure. Everything good that was coming from Palace was coming through Eze. And funny enough, as we said with the first goal, those de that those defensive moments of switching off all stemmed again from Eze switching off and being tackled. Well, first tackled, but then him switching off. But Guido wins the ball in the edge of our area. It was a brilliant tackle just from behind, just clips the ball. And Kilman's coming out to, to meet Eze, Eze previously, you know, prior to that. He then gets the ball at... Uh, Eze actually takes a moment where he turns to the ref to complain because he thinks he should get a foul. Now, we said the referee let the game go and was there were some inconsistent calls which were frustrating. However, he by and large let the game go and allowed for a physical game. It was a great tackle from Guido and Kilman just took that moment and went for it. And the fact that Eze took that slight moment meant that by the time he turned and tried to catch up with Kilman, Kilman was already gone. And that 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 small moment, it's those again, those infinitesimally small moments that can change a, a kind of an, an instant. And what was really impressive was not only did he burst past Eze like he wasn't there, was uh, Paqueta makes a smart little movement and just kind of drops back slightly into that space we kind of circled. It doesn't come right all the way back into that, but it just drops back slightly, which causes Watson that little bit of indecision because all of a sudden he's now got the point of now the balls are going to go to to Paqueta, who's going to be on my my inside. There's also a really simple pass out to Kudus. So do I now move over to do Kudus? 
And all of a sudden, there's that complete and utter indecision for Wharton. And as we said, he got dribbled past five times in this game. And this was the point that we put players in around him that we could then make passes. We could also drive past it. We constantly created indecision for him, I think, in transition. And that's why we got a lot of joy. And I do deliberate, I do think we did actually target him in transition. And what I loved about this from, from Kilman was that that confidence of I don't need Kudus, I don't need Paqueta. And bearing in mind who those two players are I've just mentioned, to have that self-belief and confidence and obviously leaning on his futsal pass, decided I'm going to go take this player on. And he absolutely leaves him for dust. Walton has just this ailing kind of sly tackle he attempts to do and Kilman just brushes him off and goes. But I think in this point here, Nicholas Falkrug needs to have so much praise put on him for that this entirety of this goal. Because if it wasn't for Falkrug and his movement and where he occupies the defenders, this goal likely doesn't happen. I know that maybe sounds stupid, but it is true. Because what you would see most times that space I've highlighted where we've got Bowen running into, that absolute open space, a lot of strikers are going to go, I'm going to run into that, which then pulls the defender over, which then closes the space in which the pass can go into for Bowen, also closes the space for Bowen. But what he does is, I'm going to keep going straight. I'm going to keep that defender there, allows Kilman to have more space. So Kudus on the outside means that Minios on the right cannot come inside to meet Kilman. He has to stay out there with, with him. And as you can see, Fulcrick stays central. We talked about that when we talked about the, the average positions, Fulcrick was always central. And by doing that, he's constantly meaning defenders have to then be aware of him. You know, uh, Guri has to come out to, to try and uh, cause problems for Kilman. Fulcrick can just move slightly into that space behind him, and that again going to pull uh, Riyad into his area. Again, creates this open space for, for Bowen. And he's a Brilliant piece of play from, from Falkworth. I'm going to praise him to no end throughout this goal because I think he deserves it. Bear in mind, Kilman was fantastic in this. And without his movement, goal doesn't happen. Bowen is brilliant in, in the sheer intensity of his run to get forward and get into a position. And Kilman's pass is absolutely perfect. Lays it on a plate for him just to run in, take it in his stride. And the moment Bowen gets the ball... He has Riyad in his pocket the entire time. He completely is controlling it. But before he even gets to this position, there's a slight little movement from Falkrook, which draws again and makes that bit of space. So he pulls Richards to where Richards is. Because instead of going towards Bowen, which we've seen Antonio do often, is try and then run in behind and essentially narrow that space for Bowen, he t goes into position and it drops back into his left and it pulls the defender away. You know, Kamada's had to burst to get in there, but he's not a defender. He doesn't really know necessarily where he needs to get into. And Riyad, again, is he's been he's been isolated because Bowen has controlled him by slowing the play down. Riyad knows he wants to go on his left foot. But Wan Basaka, again, huge, huge praise from him for this, has busted a gut to get up there to provide, again, an option on that outside. Because essentially, if Bowen was able to then reverse pass, it's going to be a simple tap-in because wan can just run the ball, pass it along the six-yard box, and then Falkirk has got a tap-in at the back post. There is no way in my mind that this... If Bowen would have made a pass to wan and had been successful, it would have been a goal. The way mm. Bowen then makes... The way he controls Riyad, pulls him inside, and then without any hesitation, just lets fly. In most players, maybe would have took another touch, but it just hits it so quick once he gets reared on kind of his back foot and keeps it gets him flat. It was just a superb transition goal. It's the kind of goals that we saw under Moyes, but I think it was done with such great execution. And I think the reason why I say it's different to the ones we'd seen with Moyes is because this is our centre back leading the charge and leading the charge as he would have. I don't think we would have seen that with Aged, definitely not Zuma because his legs can't do that, <laughs> and Mavropanos as well. I think this was Zuma from his first season with us. I, I, like that's the sort of confidence that he played with. And to your point with Fulkrug, I think the best the best thing about him and Wambasaka's movement here is that it's not only uh, creating space and creating space for other players, as you mentioned. You know, 
Fulcrugs run um, to the left of the pitch, makes that pocket, that passage for um, Kilman to pass through, that little bit bigger, that fractional fraction bigger. And, you know, if, say, Fulcrug had taken a step in the opposite direction, then Riyad can potentially intercept that pass. But Fulcrug's movement has created that. And what it does is it's not just movement that, oh, he's he's um, brought the defender away. He's also given Kilman a, a, a passing, a, a, a threat, basically. He's got two threats. He, if, he, if he'd spotted Bowen's run, he can see that he's there and he can make that one. However, he knows that the defenders have got eyes on Fulcrug and he can play it through to him. Fulcrug's given him a fantastic through ball, but it's created space for Bowen. And wan as you mentioned, he did exactly the same thing. We're giving him that outlet. Fulcrug in the middle again does it, but it creates a little bit of space and also it creates an element of doubt because you've got players who can who are in a position that creates threat. It creates a chance. It allows them to, you know, effectively contribute to the attack. It's not just a case of, oh, I've made space or I've um, I've got in the way of the attacker, which Fulcrook does. He, he does uh, get, get stuck in. And I think for the first goal as well, he actually, you know, shoulder barges one of the one of the uh, Palace players and creates that little bit more space. Um, but it's it's brilliant play. And I think, as you mentioned, the pass from Kilman cannot be understated in how good it is. Like, it's fantastically weighted. Um, and Bowen doesn't even really have to change his run at all. It's it's hit fantastically. And, yeah, I mean, this is this is the kind of goal that, again, you mentioned, you know, we saw under Moyes. And I think that going forward, hopefully we'll see a lot more of as well. Yeah, exactly. I think we'll see a lot more of that, those type of goals purely because the options we'll, we have are going to be are going to be designed around doing that. The likes of Kilman, Tadebo, Wambasaka. Also, we saw that from him. When you have your defence able to essentially lead your attack, and then your supporting players, you know, who arguably we've always had to rely on those those attackers to make something out of nothing, but to have all of a sudden your defence leading that charge and to create something means that all of a sudden it's a very hard team to defend against when you have multiple options doing that. But um, I think think as well, if if you look at the type of players that we can potentially be linked with, if we can move on Ings and say we get, we get a Duran in there or um, the, his fellow Colombian at Watford, you know, someone like that, um, Espria, I think is, is, a fantastic avenue for that sort of movement that um, gives you an option that it's not just, you know, Fulkrug creates that space. He may not have been able to, to beat um, Riyad or Gray for pace in that area. And we saw that a couple of times where, you know, he, he pretty much beat them with strength and not pace, but couldn't finish. Um, if you have someone like Duran, Espria, these big powerful centre forwards that we've kind of been linked with, then that pass becomes another very viable option in terms of he can beat the man, he can he can blast past him, and his pace will guarantee that you know he gets away from that centre back, and that then more than you know it increases the doubt in that defender's mind, and it's it's a really good passage of play. And it's exactly the sort of thing that will get rewards in this system. Absolutely, Sloth. And, and I think with that goal, that was, I think it was, yes, his seventh goal and sixth assist, sixth, sixth assist Bowen uh, in 15 games. That's what he's done. Seven goals and six assists. It's incredible, really, that when you think of what's happened in the last 15 go- games for Bowen, to, to be to putting in those numbers is great, especially from the right, right-hand side. And, you know, there were... Palace gave a couple of little warning shots, I think, towards the end. Uh, Mavropanos had one moment where he had to slide across the box to kind of off-put Mateta, um, because that really should have been a goal, but he did enough to put him off and to, uh, I guess, 
not disguise, but to hide the ball as to where it was going. But we kind of rode the game out, I think, after that. Bringing on Alvarez, I thought Alvarez was quite calm in the midfield, made a couple of really good interceptions on the edge of the box. And I think once it went 2-0, yes, there was a couple of warning shot moments, but by and large, it was a really positive result. Uh, one that we needed, bearing in mind, gives a bit of positivity going into the cup game against Bournemouth. And obviously, the, the much, much, much tougher game. No disrespect to Bournemouth, but it is Man City we're playing. <laughs> With Man City coming up, I think it gives a lot of encouragement to, to players. Um, you know, players like Mavropanos, who maybe isn't going to be a starter, but now has it in his head that, I, and at least tells the manager, I'm ready to step up if you need me. Uh, Wan Basaka made a, a very valid point as to, I now must start over Sufal. You know, Suchek is arguably, he's been a player that's rumoured to have his future maybe, uh, you know, slightly up for debate. He's probably now put himself above, say, James Ward Prowse, who didn't even get on the pitch to kind of say, you know, maybe I'm the man that stays and he's the man that actually goes. I think there's, as you said, certain players are starting to stand up uh, and kind of say that I shouldn't be considered as as someone who could could go. But that's a conversation for another day. But I, th- I think what's, at, uh, what's really brilliant about it is that you've now got the cup game and you can say to Ward Prowse, you can say to Didibo, you know, you guys are going to start. Go out and show me what you can do. And that's something we didn't have under Moyes because he liked a small squad. And, I'm, you know, that's not a dig at Moyes in any way. Um, it's, that's not what why I'm making this comment. Why I'm making yeah. this because it's so important for us to be able to have that quality rotation. But also... You know, someone someone can go to the manager and say, I'm not happy with how little I'm playing. That's perfectly healthy. Like, that's that's fine. And if if he sits down with Lopetegui, say War Prowse goes, oh, you know, I, I've barely played and it's November. Uh, I want, you know, I, I want to get back. OK, well, you know, do you feel like you've shown me why you should be starting? Because that's the other thing that I think, People often forget with 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 fo- footballers that they really like, and I don't mean this, you know, it, as a whole. I think it, it's very hard to to equate. You know, I'm the same with Suchek. I love Suchek, and I think that when he plays well, he he gives you an outlet that we saw today really worked. When he plays poorly, he plays like he did against Aston Villa, and you know there are good things, but then there are some very bad things, and it's it's very hard to balance that but again players have to do more to show why they should be involved in squads and i think that what's really healthy for us is that we've now got quality in depth to go forward and if someone is unhappy around november december then you've got that january window you can make the changes because it's a huge undertaking to to compete on multiple fronts and you look at the squad depth around us, it's growing as well. So I think for us in the table, it's it's really important that we are rotating this squad. We're, we've got a happy squad going forward, but also one that's, you know, motivated. And they know there's going to be opportunities for them to prove or earn their place in the squad. And if you can give John, James Ward-Prowse 30 minutes at the end of a game and say, go on then, go and show me what you can do. And he, he made and scored a set piece for us. I, I, like, I don't want to, don't want to uh, seem like I'm taking the mick, but you know, if, if he's got 30 minutes to prove himself, he can go a hundred percent. He can go all out and it can go well. It can go badly. It, you, you never know with football, but the important thing is they've got the opportunity to do that because that's going to be the best thing for West Ham Football Club, to have players who have a point to prove, are given 100% and are fighting for their place at the club. Yeah, that, that's absolutely spot on. So I, I can't disagree with that at all. Um, but just, just to close this out, I think for me, Max Kilman was probably man of the match. I think it was a, a brilliant performance from him um, and fantastic to see us get the three points, much needed three points at this stage. Lily agrees as well that uh, it was a great performance. <laughs> um, but so, uh, final thoughts on the game, your man in the match, and then we'll close this out. Um, I think a huge shout, like huge 
shout of, for, for the for the performance today, especially that second half. I think, to be honest, if we play like that against most teams, we'll come away with three points. It was really good to see. And when you put into you know perspective that that's without Somerville, without Ward Prowse, without Tadebo starting, then it should really give you all confidence for what's to come this season. I'm not saying, you know, we're going to win it all because, you know, we're probably not. But it's it's just something that to, to bear in mind. And I think the next few weeks are going to be really interesting to see if we do get that rotation, we do get that competition that I just mentioned. And, and you know, if if in the Cup against Bournemouth, we're playing Will Prowse, Tadebo, Somerville, that's really good. That's really good to see. Um I think Alvarez deserves a big shout for uh, when he came on. I thought he was brilliant. He really broke up play well. And he had he had an interesting moment where he kind of tried to break. And then I think he, he thought, oh, I've just come back from injury. Or, or, or like there was a bit of doubt in his mind and he stopped. But um, I think Guido, again, he deserves another bit of praise as well. Because he was excellent this week. Um and I think Kilman's man of the match for me. I, you know, I thought he was brilliant today. No, yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, so, yeah, guys, thank you for watching. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Please do like, please do subscribe if, if you're new. And if you're old to, the, to us, then please just like and all of that <laughs> stuff. Uh, but, yeah, let us know your thoughts on the game. Uh, who was your man of the match? What did you like about the game? What did you not like about the game? And... Uh, you feeling more positive now we have three points on the board. Um, but yeah, that's it, guys. Thank you for watching. Really uh, love you all for watching this again and keeping our videos going. So, uh, yeah, Sloth, one last thing to say. And that is, as ever, come on, you irons. Mm -hmm.